Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Egina Makwabe. I'm the consultant in the projects working uh, with Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. So I would like to welcome you to today's uh, AHN Educational Nephrology webinar and today's series number 93. So uh, today uh, we have a very interesting topic uh, and we have a very experienced uh, uh, speaker, um, Teresa Rodriguez, and um, is a certified nutritional support clinician, a certified specialist in renal nutrition, certified nutritional support dietitian, and a certified lead therapist. She obtained her bachelor degrees in science, majoring concentration in nutrition and diabetics in 1999 at the University of Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh, so it's a great honor, Teresa, to welcome you and to start uh, today's uh, presentation. You're so excited and you're warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys for the invitation. This is a topic that changed my life, um, like uh, about low carb diet and ketogenic changed my life a few years ago, seven years ago. And that's the reason that I start to learn more about it. And then it transformed not only my personal life transformed, not because I, I, I didn't have diabetes, but other um, major issues that I have. And I'm going to explain that to you guys later. Um, yeah. And we're going to talk. I love to talk about, about this topic for that reason. And it has been involved in many, um, you know, like uh, uh, projects that we are trying to uh, spread the world about how we can reverse type 2 diabetes with a low carb ketogenic diet. I don't have any actual potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Learning objectives to this presentation is first define diabetes type 2 and nutrition ketosis, identify foods that include in a well-formulated ketogenic diet, understand and overview the current literature available for low-carb ketogenic diet and type 2 diabetes, best practice for diabetes, patients following a low-carb ketogenic diet, and on the understanding concept that I create like a pH balanced ketogenic diet. Let's define diabetes type 2. It's characterized by insulin resistance that manifests as a carbohydrate intolerance. That's the key. Remember, it's a carbohydrate intolerance leading to elevation of blood glucose, hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia that persists over a long period of time and that um, increase the risk to develop complications, right? And even patient diet of these complications. Let's talk about diabetes in the U.S. population. More than a half of the adult um, population in the U.S. suffer from diabetes or pre-diabetes. Some estimate that more than 327 billion healthcare dollars in the U.S. are spent on diagnosis of diabetes. Sadly, one of four of Americans living with type 2, they don't know that they have diabetes. Diabetes in Africa. We know that 24 million adults, um, ages uh, 20 to 79, are living with diabetes. This estimate that that will increase to 33 million by 2030 and 55 million by 2045. 52 million adults, they have impaired glucose intolerance. That means in 2030, they will increase to 71 million and 170 million by 2045. 30 million, they live with, um, they, they don't know that they have it. They don't know, um, you know, and um, US dollars, they spend 13 mil billion dollars in healthcare, which represent 1% of the total global expenditure on diabetes. We know, and it has been very established for many, many studies that, especially with this one, according to the 2019 Global Burden of Disease Study of 195 countries, dietary factors are the single leading cause of death. But 
it's not crystal clear. It is crystal clear, right? That we know that they don't teach doctors about like how important is nutrition? How is the base of, you know, the disease, you know? And, and we have to work more on this. We have to spread the word how nutrition is so important. Like two years ago in 2020, um, 2020 um, finally, the National Kidney Foundation and Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics recognized that even in patients with prediabetes, physicians don't view the medical nutrition therapy as an integral part of chronic kidney disease. Physicians prefer to provide dietary counsel handouts in the office, channels to identify referral medical nutrition therapy they are unknown and they're unclear and still like that. <laughs> patient issues, chronic kidney disease, um, patient, they're not aware that nutrition is far and how important nutrition is to reverse diabetes, to reverse, if we reverse diabetes, obviously, we could reverse chronic kidney disease. Dietary information in the, di in the physician's office, you know, uh, they love Google as a doctor, Google doctor, <laughs> more than us <laughs> to, um, you know, to follow what he said, Google doctor. And it's very, it's a lot of conflicting information, um, overworn, confusing, and potential harmful. Since 2009, um, um, finally, um, was the first time that we hear that we can reverse diabetes. And people think that diabetes is a chronic disease, it's a life sentence, it's not a way that you can reverse diabetes. But it was until 2009 that we hear for the first time that we reverse diabetes. Even sometimes when I say that to other health professionals that were looking at me, are you crazy? No way that we can reverse diabetes. Finally, the American Diabetes Association recognized three ways that we can reverse and re, um, put in remission type 2 diabetes. Bariatric surgery, um, home mortality could increase. I call this way like a band-aid <laughs> because it's really it is. Um, it's, it is part of what they're doing right now, but I have many patients that they call me after this medical procedure because they're gaining weight again. And again, it's because not they're not addressing the root cause. And we're gonna talk about that later. Another, another way that we can reverse diabetes is the low carb, um, low calorie, low carb diet, but it's a low fat too. And people can get bored about this. Um, the adherence was not good. Um, and, and the other option is a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet that has been changing life since 2008, 2010. Well, no, see, um, since 100 and 102 years. Um, yeah. Um, Berta Health did a survey and then asked um, how appealing was this method for patients. And only 13% say that bariatric surgery was appealing for them. Remember, it's very expensive. People can spend, here I have cases that they spend like $80,000 for that. Um, and they have the risk for surgery and they start getting weight again. Um, for low calorie, low carb, um, low fat diet, 35% say um, they were appealing for them. However, for low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, 56% they say they were appealing. Let's talk about keto diet history. People talk or hear about ketogenic diet and they're thinking, oh my God, it's a new diet, it's a fat diet, um, you know, but ketogenic diet has been out for 102 years. Epilepsy started with um, the treatment with epilepsy in 1920. When the Mayo Clinic started to use that kind of therapy, the classic ketogenic diet, four to one ratio, when I say four to one is four times the amount of fat versus the amount of protein and carbs. In 1930, uh, the demands or the people to follow ketogenic diet decreased because start the first drug that we can use for epilepsy. And then in 1971, um, 
that Dr. Peter introduced another method that was more liberal um, in terms of carbohydrate, flexible in terms of the carbohydrate intake using medium chain triglyceride. In 1984 um, was the first movie out about telling the story about Charlie. Um, Charlie was a kid that have epilepsy and Gene Abraham, who is his father, um, he, he did, um, he was a movie, movie producer and he did this to let the world know that is another option using ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy. Modified ketogenic diet, Dr. Um, Kossoff from, um, from John Hopkins created the modified Atkin diet. And it's like a little bit more flexible in terms of carbs too. Low glycemic index. Um, and in 2005, more ketogenic diet, um, they has been like, right now they estimate more, but countries that they know more about the ketogenic diet. Since then, um, 2010, we has been using ketogenic diet for non-epilepsy diseases. And we're gonna talk about that later. It's interesting because for epilepsy, we don't know in some people, some patients is okay, but um, we know that if, if the patient is into two or more medications, it should be on, I should, at least should try ketogenic diet. Uh, but in other diseases that I'm gonna explain later, it is amazing how it changed um, everything. In nutrition ketosis, what is nutrition ketosis? Normally, glucose is the primary source of energy of your cell. Um, during fasting time, more than 72 hours, or we use 50 grams intake of carbohydrate per day can create ketones, and you can use that as an energy source for your glucose. There are three ways that we measure ketones. Um, acetone is, you excel that through your lungs. We don't recommend to monitor that way. Um, use a monitor if you have lung problems, lung issue, asthma, COPD. Um, we don't recommend that method for measure that. Your ketones level, acetoacid acid, we measure the ketones in your urine. Beta hydroxybutyrate is the most abundant ketone circulated in the blood and is the most preferred method to measure your ketones level. Nutrition ketosis is really interesting and I want to point out it doesn't equal diabetes ketosidosis. Um, you can be in a ketogenic diet and even have ketones like uh, levels of five and you will not be or go to diabetes ketosidosis. The people that are at risk for diabetes ketosidosis is mostly the people that they're on insulin and they have to be under medical care. Um, glucose and ketogenic diet, we see that normal glucose is between 60 to 90. Usually this is very individualized. Um, for example, I run like 50 um, to 90. Um, you just monitor that person and then find out which one is the average in that particular person. Insulin, 6.6 to 9.4. Ketones, we talk about ketosis, nutrition ketosis is more than 0 0.5 up to 5. But let me tell you something. When you monitor ketones, all depend on the... Um, the patient that you are treating. For example, my patients with epilepsy, I they run if they're between three to four, that is most of my patients with epilepsy, they're fine on that. However, in the topic that we're talking today about diabetes, we know that even nutrition ketosis of um, 0 0.1, we see changes in patients' lives. Well, formulary low carb ketogenic diet, the Western diet is 60% carbs, right? It's like a typical diet, it's a high carb, 15% uh, protein and 25% fat. And usually like really, really bad fats. Um, low carb diet is 50% fat, 20% 
um, carbohydrate and 30% protein. Ketogenic diet is usually 5% carb, 20% um, protein, and 75% um, fat. When we talk, most of the study talk about well formulary ketogenic diet. When you when you see all the studies done, they are gonna they're gonna say, well, this is our well formulary ketogenic diet. What is common on this um, concept? It's really important that they can shift the body into ketogenic state or nutritional ketosis. It's very individualized. It's personalized. Limit carbohydrate to approximately three to 10% of the calories or 20 to 50 grams of carb per day. Limit protein to 0.8 to 1.5 grams per kilograms of body weight. Intake fat to achieve, achieve and maintain ketosis. Fluids are now typically restricted and it, that is real, real important. And we're gonna talk later about, uh, about that. Medical supervision and close collaboration with dietitian is encouraged. In, uh, we has been, I'm a member of a group um, that we has been working to try to create guidelines. Um, in 2018, um, the low group of Low Car USA tried to collect the most evidence, post scientific science evidence. And then we, um, we just, um, as a dietitian, we have a group that we meet at least once a month. And we has been discussing all these topics about, you know, the definition, how we can define. And, um, and in 20, um, late, um, last year, we, um, with Adele Height, um, we created this um, concept of therapeutic, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. Um, we define very low carb diet, um, ketogenic, um, like 30% or less low carbohydrate ketogenic between 30 to 50 grams a day, reduce carbohydrate to a 50, 130 grams a day, moderate carbohydrate calorie restricted, be at least um, 130 grams off the carbs a day or 45 to 65% of the daily calories. And um, again, we adjust the calories based on the, pa uh, no calories, the carbs based on the patient needs. It's really interesting that because, I don't know, I'm an old dietitian and um, I just say I graduated in 1990s. And, um, you know, before we hear like about calories, 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 and we know now that is more important about how you manipulate the macronutrients. And we're gonna talk later about it. Finally, in 2019, we have been working on this in private care, in clinics, you know, we meet, but um, finally in 2019, the American Diabetes Association did a consensus report. And it was really important for us. We were, we were in shock. <laughs> when they present that, because, you know, it's like we has been working, 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 trying to spread the word about this. And finally, they recognize that the amount of carbohydrate in there required for optimal health in human is unknown. I, uh, we recommend, they recommend dietary allowance of carbs um, for the 19 years and older of carbs, 130 grams of carbs a day for the brain requirement for glucose. I learned that in the 1980s. And I was like, oh my gosh, every day I was, I need 180 grams every day for my brain, you know? But now we know that um, this energy requirement can be fulfilled by the body metabolic processes which include glyconeogenesis and ketogenesis. Low carb eating pattern for the first time they recognize, especially the very low carb diet has been shown to reduce A1C, the need for anti-hyperglycemic medications, also increase the weight reduction, blood pressure, decrease blood pressure, um, um, you know, decrease triglyceride and increase HDL. For the first time, after many years that we, we worked, you know, finally they recognized this is, was an important point when they published this. 
the American Heart Association, one of the biggest concern, um, and I'm, I'm sure that you know about this, uh, was, oh my gosh, ketogenic diet can cause heart disease. Well, finally, in the American, the American Heart Association did a scientific statement in 2022, and they recognized that Mediterranean paleo, low-carb, high-protein, vegetarian, and not not enriched diet decrease the you know improve the control of the glucose level and mediterranean diet style produce greater glycemic control and decrease cardiovascular risk 29 percent for 4.8 years very low carb 20 to 60 grams a day create um decrease a1c weight loss reduce your glycerol um some patients they don't need more the diabetes medications maintain medical oversight and adjust diabetes diabetes medication to prevent hypoglycemia was encouraged low carb 120 to 25 grams a day that was the compared um, group help but was unable to adhere to a low a carbohydrate calorie restricted diet this means that for the first time, they recognize the American Heart Association, they recognize even that the low carb diet could benefits for heart disease. Um, they has been recognized that decrease the risk of some cardiometabolic risk factors, it decrease insulin, decrease triglyceride, decrease triglyceride, uh, cholesterol HDL ratio, decreased inflammation, um, decreased fasting blood sugar, waist and height ratio, insulin resistance, triglyceride HDL ratio. Increased HDL, increase the particle size of the LDL, but we know that if they increase the particle size, increase the ones that they are fluffy and they are not attached, and that will decrease the cardiovascular risk. It's really important. This, uh, uh, this, all this statement done by the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association finally uh, were published and recognized more now in 2022. They just published a standard of medical care in diabetes. And uh, one important thing, and I see that in my practice all the time, is reducing overall carbohydrate intake for individual with diabetes has demonstrated most evidence, even more than medication for improving glycemia and may be applied to any variety, um, variety of eating pattern that meet uh, patient's needs and preference that I see all the time. And I'm gonna explain later that to you. We can apply this to ev any place in the world. Uh, because you can adjust that based on the patient preference. Most important that uh, in 2020 group, uh, 2021, a group of experts from the American Diabetes Association, the Endocrine Society, the Europe European Association of the, for the Study of Diabetes and Diabetes UK, release a consensus statement that define diabetes remission as sustained normal glucose level for three more or uh, three months or more. Um, it's really important uh, remission again should be defined as um, let me just move this as a return of A1C to less than 6.5 that occur spontaneously or following an intervention and persist for more than three months in the absence of glucose lowering pharmacology. More than that, finally, they define black and white reversals. Yes, we can reverse diabetes. It's used to describe, they define this consensus statement, mm. define reversal is to describe the process of returning to glucose level below those diagnoses of diabetes. Virtual Health is the one um, company that has been helping us to demonstrate that you can achieve that. 
and um, they used less than 6.5 without the use of diabetes medication, only with metformin. Why metformin? Because metformin is not diabetes specific medications. We use it as a treatment for other conditions like prediabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Let me just try to put this here. That for the first time, finally, after many years that we were working behind the scenes, you know, they um, finally, they just released this consensus and they, uh, they just established what we can that we can reverse diabetes is an accepted term. We can reverse, um, can be sustained. The readmission, uh, re remission is defined again for um, the one returning to normal A1C without drugs for three um, more months. Three more some months. The revolution of low carb because the pandemic um, is really interesting because this study, uh, Bertel did, did a clinical trial and it is interesting because everything was virtual and was based on scientific foundation, based on clinical expert, Dr. Finney, Dr. Balek. Um, they monitor ketones weight energy, blood sugar, hunger and cravings. Um, it was really individualized, real time was adapted. They use an app to monitor their patients and the patients, for example, has any situation, put it there and then the clinical team answered their questions. Um, they collect some medical history, health history, family restrictions, medications, life circumstances, dietary restrictions. And that's the reason that we have been seeing all these benefits of reversal of diabetes. This is the um, last month, <laughs> just last month, um, Berta Health present this um, clinical trial results, preliminary clinical trial results, where they saw, um, they found that 33% they were able to achieve reversal or drug-free remission after five years of treatment. That is amazing. And um, after five years of treatment, again, 33% of the patients that complete the clinical trial were able to reverse or full remission their diabetes. The study also revealed re, uh, reveal that very low carb diet can produce other health benefits, even if they were not able to reverse or go into remission. Pa participants who complete five years shows that weight loss of 7.6%, 60 60% reduction in medications, improving, improvement in cardiovascular health, a marker of kidneys and liver functioning increased perception of control over eating. Following a low carb diet will help you to control hunger. More than that, they were able to, um, to establish, you know, how much we're spending treating uh, treat diabetes with medications and medications and medications, you know, and the patients is not aware that if they control carbs, you know, where is going to be able to control their diabetes. The patients continue to eat high carb diet and they continue to receive a lot of medications. That is what we're seeing right now. And with this pattern, it can cause in years um, after diagnosed more than 10,000 with aggressive insulin. Let me tell you something right now, there are patients that are using credit cards to afford the treatment that they need every month for the diabetes. They were not aware when I talked to them about, you can reverse this, you know, you can, um, we, we're gonna work um, slowly and uh, I'm gonna explain to you my tech, what I use, but patients need to know about this because they're not aware. They just continue to use and use and use the medications. And that's the reason that this kind of topic is important to address 
especially with you guys and dietitians. Um, and this study too, this research were able to demonstrate that it didn't matter and I have that and many of us um, have cases that there are an insulin treatment, aggressive insulin, even high dose of insulin, but in weeks, we can reverse, we're able to reverse um, completely diabetes and they don't have to spend all this money. But despite of international consensus on remission and reversals and mountain of evidence, patients are not aware that this is, a, this is an alternative method to reverse diabetes or diabetes management. In a national survey, 78% of the people with type 2 diabetes say that they were unaware of reversal or knew every little about it. People are not aware that they can reverse diabetes. The only that they hear is it's a chronic disease, just continue with your medication. It's nothing that you can eat, that you can do. You can eat all the carbs because the medications are gonna cover for that. This is not the way we're going. We need to address the root cause and the root cause is carbohydrate intolerance. We need to educate more the people that we see every day. We, um, yeah. It's really interesting because as I mentioned before, even in my personal case, when I start doing ketogenic myself, um, I was not aware that I can use for the treatment for my uh, issues. And I was getting blind seven years ago, but this is not a topic today, maybe for another, for another topic, <laughs> we're gonna cover that. But uh, we use um, ketogenic diet, low carb diet, not only for weight reduction, we use for epilepsy, we use for cancer, we use poly, um, um, 60 ovarian syndrome, neurological diseases, acne. Now with this group of dietitians that we meet um, at least once a month, not during the summertime, obviously, <laughs> but we're going to start to meet again soon. Um, if somebody's interested, let me know. Is a dietitian here? Let me know. Uh, it, they're, you know, welcome to join us. And, um, you know, we're just trying to collect data. And this is a draft of what we're doing right now. We're trying to collect or put it together like a document that will help doctors and haircut healthcare professionals to understand more about how to manage ketogenic or therapeutic carbohydrate reductions. And if you see on the left side, you see all this, this is our um, diseases that has been well documented by studies that we it help low carb or ketogenic will help to treat that. Um, again, this is a draft of what we're doing right now. If anyone is, uh, wants to um, learn more about it, just let me know. But it's an issue here. Uh, when we um, do Google, <laughs> Google um, ketogenic diet, we mostly um, hear more about the dairy ketogenic diet. And that is a point that we have to clarify. And I love to clarify that because when we treat and we use ketogenic diet as a treatment, it's a clean ketogenic diet. It's not a dairy ketogenic diet. Um, it's a low carb, sugar free, and gluten free. It's really important to understand right now, I have been using to treat ketogenic diet, low carb diet, because um, I'm not working anymore in hemodialysis or PD or kidney transplant right now. Uh, some cases of kidney transplant, but um, no, a lot. Uh, but I'm using like full time, like river inpatient with chronic kidney disease and polycystic kidney disease. And I have many successful story. But even, I wanna tell you, even, um, the treatment for chronic kidney disease and polycystic kidney disease or any of other therapy for, um, to help um, with a kidney disease, even the keto low carb diet could be different. And um, that is really important to understand because when I see the patient, you know, I have the guidelines in my mind, right? I have um, the ketogenic low carb diet and that has been trained by the Charlie Foundation and other um, keto university. And I get training all the time about keto low carb. 
I have that on my mind, but at the same time, I have in my mind my years of critical care, my years of kin uh, renal dietitian, functional dietitian. And when I see that, when I see a patient, every time that I see a patient, I love first to have their genetics. Uh, for me, genetics is the key point, and I hope that um, I have been using genetics for seven years already, uh, but I, and that was the key point to reverse what I have and reverse many conditions of my patients. And I hope that maybe soon healthcare professionals, uh, you know, health insurance will cover that too. Exercise that the patient do, uh, inflammation, what kind of uh, monitor the patients do, Spanish, you know, oxalates issue, um, ketogenic diet, what kind of keto the patients start to do, if it's um, dairy keto or clean keto, fasting, salt intake, dehydration, you know, how is the um, gut issues, any gut issues or any lifestyle. Every time that I see a patient has to be a personalized approach. And that is one of the uh, benefits that virtual uh, health found because they follow the patient all the time. Every time that they address um, the patient was personalized. I create a system and um, for me, ketogenic diet is a lifestyle. When we talk about ketogenic diet, real ketogenic diet is a lifestyle. It's something that you need to follow for the rest of your life. Um, and personal care, for example, if in patients with epilepsy or any, um, like every carb count, you know, um, in some diseases like diabetes, we could be more flexible. But in epilepsy, we have to count, especially if they're in 4 to 1 ratio. We have to count everything, all carbs. And even things that they use like shampoo or creams, that can increase the carbohydrate intake. We have a guidelines for that. If you, if you want to learn about it, just let me know. I can send that information to you. Detoxify your body. Um, you know, it's like we have some techniques to remove more toxins um, from your body and release the kidneys to work more. Um, intermittent fasting, that is a big error that a lot of people are making. Um, I'm not a big fan of long-term intermittent fasting. I feel like it, it is amazing because I feel fasting is like you take the trash out of your house every day. When you do intermittent fasting, it's like take the trash out of, help to take the trash out um, of your body too but we have to do it in the right way. Why? Because we know, especially I work in critical care for 22 years, and I know that how important is lean body mass to keep your lean body mass safe. And, um, and for me, intermittent fasting, if you do it for more than 24 hours, you can start to lose lean body mass and we have to be careful. Um, binder if needed. Um, in some cases I need to use special binders if they're exposed to mycotoxins. And, you know, I do another um, testing for my patients like organic acid testing, um, toxic and um, other testing, heavy metals. Um, check pH in urine and ketones if it's needed. Um, I love them to monitor the ketones and pH in urine. Um, exercise, yoga, meditation, pH balance, drink. I'm going to talk about that. pH balance, ketogenic diet, hydration, adequate supplementation. One of the biggest mistakes that the patient do is taking synthetic vitamins. And um, as I told you before, I do genetics and most of them, they're not able to tolerate synthetic vitamins. They're not able to um, convert that in the active form. And we have to be careful with that because that creates more issues in your body. Avoid phosphate additive. This is a project that has been working. I started to work, I did a project, a research project in 2009 and with one of my interns and it's insane. I'm gonna show you that later, but uh, for me, phosphate additives is one of the number one things that is increasing cardiovascular risk and is killing people. Um, sleep, detoxify properly. Epsom salt bath, especially if you have oxalates issue, could help um, your body to detox oxalates too. 
for that reason, it's very important to take a medical nutrition history properly. Um, ask our patient about how is your stress level? Are you sleeping okay? Uh, you know, dehydration, alcohol intake, candida overgrow, food intolerance, cosmetic, because I told you that some that can provide toxin and then they can provide carbs too. Signs and symptoms. And it's really interesting because this week, um, you know, it was a research um, that shows how we're missing to especially patients with kidney disease, how we're missing asking them about signs and symptoms. And for me, it's crucial. As we, you know, that is one of the first things that I do with my patients um, when they start in my clinic. Laboratory data, uh, really important to monitor everything. You're in pH to monitor that. Um, A1C, again, the definition for diabetes, A1C, we saw that is less um, than 6.5 for diabetes, uh, for intolerance or pre-diabetes is between 100 to 125. Um, for um, oral glucose tolerance tests is between 140 and 199 for diabetes and more than 200 for diabetes. The problem that we're having is, um, and that is one thing that I want to address is like when we check the labs, um, we say, oh, you're fine because uh, your A1C is 6.2 and you co you're completely fine. You don't have diabetes. But I feel like we're missing telling the patients you have prediabetes. And you, if you don't take care of that, you will increase the risk for diabetes. I will encourage all healthcare professionals that if they see A1C, you know, um, in the levels for prediabetes between 5.7 to 6.4, tell the patients that they have prediabetes, okay? Because we're missing that in a lot of patients. Another things and key factors that we're missing is, and I, I don't know, I'm an old dietitian, and when I did my internship in the 1990s, I have to do a physical assessment for my patients. And then, I have to find out, you know, if they have acantosis, skin cacks, candida overgrow, and then create a plan for that. And it's really important because we're missing that. We're missing like signs and symptoms or physical symptoms of insulin, um, you know, secretion, um, insulin intolerance. Um, candida overgrow. If you don't control candida, you will not be able to control glucose level or your condition in general. Candida can make you to create more oxalates like, you know, in your body too. And um, candida is like, you're, you're gonna be like a robot. You're gonna, you want sugar all the time. If you wanna control your cravings, you have to receive treatment for candida if needed. Another thing that we have to address is, um, you know, if any issue, any gastrointestinal issue, because if we don't, we don't address that, we're not going anywhere. You know, it's like uh, we need to fix our GI tract, our complete GI system, and prevent leaky gut in order to heal. And factors that increase the risk are stress, toxin, gluten drugs, pathogens, blood glucose issues, food allergies, um, low um, acid and enzymes. It can cause you know, holes in the UI, GI tract and things that they're not supposed to go to your blood, go to your blood and that cause brom, uh, blood brain barrier breach, inflammation, autoimmune disease, malabsorption and nutrient deficiency. We have to address that in all our patients too. One thing that has been doing over the past seven years, because my personal experience is nutrigenomics. I use um, ge um, genetic testing because it will, it will guide me to already know, it's a, genetic is the blueprint of your body. You know, it's like, it's you. And will let, we guide me to understand, okay, what is causing inflammation at cellular level? What is causing your insulin resistance? What is causing your blood pressure? We always assume, for example, the high blood pressure is because, you know, you're eating a lot of salt. And when we go to genetics, it's because they have like really bad risk for vitamin D deficiency, histamine issues, and then glucose insulin resistance. 
Another thing is that when we create a ketogenic diet, we have to follow guidelines from the National Kidney Foundations and the American uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And one thing is that I'm so picky about it is just keep an, um, an environment that will, I will not promote the further kidney damage or further disease in that particular patient. One thing that I, I um, you know, I try to manage is the acid loads, um, you know, and for me, in this statement from them, um, they say that um, in adults of three to five, um, you know, kidney disease, um, the level of 24 to 26 is okay, you know, it should be at that level. For me, based on my clinical experience, it doesn't matter that the patient is a stage one, if I see that is a high risk for acid load, I will start to manage that patient. I will not wait um, because the patient is not stage four, it's stage three yet. I'm, I'm going to wait for, you know, for, to be at least 24. No, I'm, I, my marker always when I see a patient, especially when they're high risk for kidney disease, I use 24, the uh, carbon dioxide. I create like a pH balanced ketogenic diet for that reason. And it's, uh, it's really important to understand that ketogenic diet is a whole food diet. It's on processed foods. Uh, we, you know, like refined foods that are not here in the list. Um, protein, we use 0 0.6 to 1.2, all depend of, you know, how we, the proteins that we need to preserve lean body mass. Fat, we use it only to achieve nutrition ketosis. Um, prefer monounsaturated fat and um, versus other kind of fats, um, especially if you're a high risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, carbohydrate, um, again, we talk about three to 10 percent or 20 to 50 grams a day of carb. Um, it's really important that we adjust that based on the inflammation status of the patient. Is gluten free? Is not ketogenic? That is gluten. Um, most of the people um, they have uh, by genetics they have gluten intolerance, and they they're not aware, and they are causing the leaky gut every day. You know, every time that they eat gluten, that's the reason that they know they they don't improve. Um, in some patients, um, they have to avoid lactose if they're intolerant, but we're going to talk about that. Is um, the initial state, um, when we start to work with a patient with a ketogenic diet, it, we start to clean the pantry, clean the kitchen, you know, um, in preparation for them to start like low-carb ketogenic diet. Um, second stage is keto application, and we're going to talk about that. And third stage, when the patient has okay, when they meet already the goals, when the, when the uh, glucose is back to normal, um, they can have flexible carbohydrate intake because they had advanced metabolic flexibility. Um, how we teach the patients weekly meals plans and week number one, we usually um, recommend to at least once, a, once of the meals be a low carb, okay? And then the second uh, week, we recommend two of the meals to be a low carb keto. And the third week, we all follow exactly what you have to follow, exactly like all depend on what the dietitian recommend in that case. But this is the way to do it. You know, if you go to internet keto, they say people hear that, keto help and they from the 250 or 300 grams of carbs that they're doing daily they just drop to 20 grams a day and that's the, that is dangerous you know we have to do it slowly um because it can create electrolyte imbalance what i did was in a, um, the ph ketogenic diet that i create this concept is because i want again to prevent acid load and um, what I did was I created like a system that 70 or 80% of the meal should be like very alkaline foods. And then 20 to 30% all depend on the patient. Um, it could be, you know, foods that, that are a little bit acid. But if we combine with, you know, like, for example, a meal, like a, I would say like a salmon with 
um, you know, like um, vegetables, um, you know, pasta sauce, or, you know, we can add um, um, foods that can balance that diet, that meal, and we create like a balancing pH in your body. Uh, it's really important, and we talk about, you know, um, how we advance kidney disease, how we advance all these diseases, is because we continue to eat high acid low diet, and that increases the uh, bone re resor resorption, bone density decrease, fractures, osteoporosis, calcium excretion, excretion, reabsorption of citrate, ammonium production, high uric acid, insulin resistant, diabetes, cortisol, um, you know, will increase hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. Another thing that is really important to understand, and we have to adjust in a ketogenic diet, is when uh, when in, we are in a ketogenic diet because we don't need a lot of insulin to process our foods, uh, we are going to excrete more like fluids and we're going to excrete more sodium. But when we talk about salt or sodium intake, we have to let our patients know that we have to avoid processed salt or seasoning. For example, most I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico <laughs> and some of this, um, products contain phosphate additive, you know, they're increasing, no, um, you know, their lack of minerals, they have phosphate additive. When we talk about to our patients, recommend um, just real salt, you know, especially the ones that are rich on minerals that will help to alkaline your body. Another thing is fluid intake. When we talk about ketogenic diet, again, it's like a normal diuretic in your body. Um, and that's the reason I want to encourage my patients to drink more fluids. Um, talk to your doctor and let them know that, you know, you're following ketogenic diet. And then the doctor adjusts your water pill dose if you are on that. Um, and be careful because, for example, in the U.S., we have a lot of, even where we live, you know, there are a lot of toxins in their, in their water. Just use, like, you know, like a stainless steel water, um, you know, um, bottle, but don't use the plastic bottle because that increases the risk for even, even hormonal imbalances. One of the things that I'm so picky and, and, and people are, I don't know, they're not aware, even doctors, that, that how dangerous are the phosphate additive in our life. And people are so itchy. People have like itchy skin, like bone disease and, uh, you know, um, calcium phosphor deposit in different parts of the body, you know. And it's because they're eating a lot of foods that are high, it contains um, phosphate additive, phosphoric, phosphoric acid, the calcium phosphate, sodium phosphate, you know, and this create an imbalance in your body and will create um, all these issues. Way that we have to identify, I encourage my patients, well, if they follow the whole, you know, um, whole foods, they will not have a problem because it's not labeled what they're using. But um, if they're using supplements, be careful. For example, I'm not mentioned like, um, you know, products, but for example, this particular product that we see for the, the um, you know, the first one, say the calcium phosphate. And this is a product that we use in the stage five kidney disease. And, um, and a lot of doctors don't know where, you know, they're using that product in particular to reverse or keep you out of dialysis. However, it contains the calcium phosphate. Always check the label, especially the ingredient section. Phosphate can cause vascular calcification, endothelial, endothelial dysfunction, apoptosis, you know, increase the kidney disease progression, um, bone disease, and left ventricular hypertrophy and anemia. A lot of problems. One of the other issues that we have to address is oxalates. So maybe it could be a topic for another time, but oxalate is a big issue, especially that's the reason I do genetics because it can let me know if the patient can could have oxalates issue. Um, the thing is oxalate can come from candida overgrowth. It can come from mold like aspergillus, penicillin. And that is the reason that we have to be careful. 
right now uh, is a connection between oxalates and autoimmune disease, at least 18 autoimmune diseases. Oxalates is more than kidney stones. And this is another message that I want to tell you. Uh, when you follow ketogenic diet, probably you increase the risk, um, you know, the intake of almonds, spinach, you know, and they're high risk, they're high on oxalates. That's the reason that when we see the patient, we have to address if this particular patient is a high risk for oxalates issue. And for that reason, you have to just talk to the patient, any family history, um, and then address that. Um, in my patients, I create like my, I create to each patient their own protocol for oxalates. Um, and it's really important to address that because it can cause further kidney damage. It can cause any, any progression of any disease in your body. Gut health, alkalosis, and electrolytes. Ensure adequate fluid intake in each patient. Adequate sodium, potassium, magnesium based on their needs. Um, gut support, um, we know form, well formulated ketogenic diet, use fiber if needed, prebiotics if needed, probiotic if it's needed, um, micronutrient deficiency. Um, it's really important to consider um, the complex B vitamin supplementation because remember, if we're not eating the carbs, they're the ones that mostly provide um, complex B vitamins, and sometimes we need the supplementations. Monitor your, um, your ketones, monitor your glucose, your pH in urine. We can stop diabetes and we can let the pa patients know that if they follow low carb ketogenic diet, they can stop and they can reverse diabetes too. And the greatest medicine of all is to teach people how not to um, need it. Okay, and there are some resources that I use from the Charlie pa Foundation, Metabolic Multiplier, and Virta Health. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this today. Um, any questions, concerns? Let's see. Wow, Teresa, okay. that was excellent presentation. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. That was exciting. And yeah, so uh, Teresa, uh, before I ask you questions, I would like to ask, uh, the participant to just type your questions, uh, the question and answer question or your chat box, and then Teresa will be able to answer all the questions. Uh, but that was excellent, excellent presentation. Teresa, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, how long, the, how can you sustain, how long can you sustain the reversal of diabetes using low carbon uh, keto diet, you know, is it uh, lifelong or yes, some couple of years? Sure. Let me tell you, um, huh? like I, I, I don't, I didn't use it for diabetes, but when I learned a ketogenic diet can reverse what I have in my genetics, what I have, in, you know, people realize that and people feel so much better that they don't, they don't want to, other, they don't want to eat carbs. Uh, like, like, they did before. Maybe they eat it more like regular, but like good carbs. And that is really important. When you have the personal approach and, um, and you feel the way that you feel following this, um, people uh, have so many amazing stories with that. People continue with for a long time for the rest of their life without diabetes because they know what they have to do. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Teresa, can you go through the question from your chat box or from Say, how Q&A? Do we go ketogenic practical part in our developing country pork and plant oils? Based on, you know, it's, as I say, you adjust ketogenic diet, even you can do, um, you know, like an options, like you don't have to eat pork, you know, like a pork or you know you adjust it so um, based on your preference based on your tolerance you don't have to um, do that um, between remission and reversal okay let's go back to that point um, to reversals and remission again um, let me just go back because I wanted you to see it again um, let me just go back okay maybe some people miss that part of the definitions of reversal and um, 
Let me just go back quickly. Okay, let's go here. Okay, remission is, um, let's go back. I don't know. Remission is when you see the patient slapped and that patient, after they received the treatment, went back, go back to the A1C less than 6.5. And um, it persists for more than three months, okay? That is remission. When the patient were able to reach less than 6.5 and reversal is when, um, obviously, when the patient doesn't need um, any medication to treat that, um, you know, that um, diabetes. Maybe some, they will need metformin, but in most of the cases, I will say that they don't even need metformin. Um, when we teach them, I have patients that they, they were high dose of insulin for years, like 20, 25 years. And then um, when we start to treat them, they reverse completely and they don't need even no medications. Um, diabetes reversal implies to re regenerate lost beta salt mass in diabetes. Is there any diet therapy shown to restore beta salt mass? Uh, it's not like, uh, remember, every time that you eat carb, I, I just explain this way to my patients. Like It's like to go to the gas station. You have two options. You have the gas that is carbs, refined sugar, you know, all this sugar, um, or you go to the diesel, which is like, uh, you know, like more like lean protein, vegetables, like low carb vegetables. Every time that you eat, the, you put the gas in your body, you put the carbs or you put the refined sugar, what is happening? You don't need, you need a lot of insulin secretion, right? And every time that you promote more and more insulin secretion and you don't need it, you, you need it to obtain that carb and take it to the cell, you're promoting inflammation, fluid retention, sodium retention. And later on, because you're doing, doing that every time, you're promoting more, you're killing more beta cell. However, when you are not promoting the secretion of insulin all the time, you can reverse that. Um, you can reverse because you don't need a lot of insulin um, to catch that glucose and take it to the cell. Yeah, you're using or producing ketones. In the five-year research um, success, reverse of diabetes, what were the average year of most success patients sustained to be able to stop medication. There were five years. Um, this is a new clinical trial and built our health. It's the only company that has been doing, well, they're doing more trials right now. Um, Dr. Westman is doing studies in Duke University. And Dr. Westman has been very successful. He has very successful clinic in Duke University. <laughs> he has a clinic that nobody, you know, the ones that um, has to take care of the things that doctors say, you know, it's nothing that we can do for you. And they go to a clinic and they can reverse that uh, the way that doing the low carb diet. Um, in the five research cases, the average year of most successful patients sustained to be able to stop medications. Um, there is a preliminary data. Uh, Birta also present that uh, preliminary data. They the full data is not out yet. Um, but I'm he um, here. You have the reference that I, I can give you. That the reference. Um, they didn't say a lot <laughs> in that presentation. They just say um, you know um, does um, some points. But in details, details, um, you know, they were not uh, presenting a lot of details. But this is like, um, you know, it was a preliminary data. Any other question or comments? Um, if somebody want to join, if there are dietitians here that want to join our group, it's completely voluntary. It's not pay for that. <laughs> and But you will learn a lot. Um, about low carb ketogenic diet and um, and how we can manage, you know, using other diseases too. I have so many successful story um, 
successful study with a lot of disease, other diseases. Um, let me see what else. Any other question or concern? Uh, just one question. Thank you very much, Teresa, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Really very uh, interesting and you know, uh, a lot of uh, clarity on a lot of aspects. Uh, one question, can you classify that, uh, you know, fasting, uh, what are the different types of fa fasting that you, uh, I mean, uh, that are the intermittent is only one of them. What about the others? Uh, all depend on the patients. Um, yeah. Based on the studies, uh, the ones that um, take uh, intermittent fasting or um, let me just, I have a full class of that. <laughs> Uh, you know, all depend. I would say that um, in terms of diabetes, the ones that has more benefits is 16 hours fasting and an eight hours window to eat um, in terms of diabetes. Um, and that is what most of the people do. But again, fasting, you have to do it in the right way. Um, there are some people that even compete in. I don't know if you, know, <laughs> if you go to, a, you know, any like social media that are competing about, oh my God, let's do fasting for 72 hours or one week, it doesn't matter. And it is only important to understand that every time that you're doing fasting, why you have to do it in the right way. For example, the accumulation of our toxins is in our fat tissue. And, um, and then if you do fasting for a long time, you're releasing a lot of toxins. And if you have kidney disease, that will burn the kidney, more kidney, can cause more kidney damage, uh, you know, or any, even progression of any other disease. Uh, and that is the main concern that I have. Also, when you do it like a, more than 24 hours, you can increase the risk for, um, you know, lose lean body mass. Some people do like one day, uh, one day, one every other day. Um, some people do like uh, for three days or, or water fasting, but I really uh, don't recommend um, to do fasting if you're not under care of a healthcare professional because they have to see the whole points. Um, fasting is not for everyone. We have to do it in the right way. Yeah, all the pain is very individual. Um, what about, that's one little uh, small thing. What about that eight hour period of eating? At that point in time, what is the quantum of uh, food that one can consume? And, uh, uh, and what will be the carbs there? You take low carbs, what about the, uh, uh, would you uh, use a ketogenic diet there in that eight hour window? Will it help in any way? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. In that in that eight hour period of intermittent fasting, when you eat, uh, do you um, uh, uh, take a ketogenic diet? Would it help in taking a, I mean, a, a consuming a low carb diet and a, and, and a ketogenic diet in that eight hour period? Yeah, you know, one thing is, it, it, yeah, you can incorporate ketogenic diet as part of your uh, intermittent of any kind of fasting, especially 16, eight to your eating patterns, ketogenic low carb diet, because that will help you when you follow low carb diet will help you to be more or mimic more the state of um, fasting. Remember ketogenic diet is another way that we mimic fasting. Um, and you can adopt that as part of the part of the low carb ketogenic diet. Yes, you can do it. I do it all the time. Yeah. Um, but you That's decide one. which one you're going to do it. You know, like uh, if you're doing every other day or um, some people do OMA, that is one meal a day and do more time on, on fasting. Um, but again, you have to do it in the right way. You have, yeah, you incorporate ketogenic and will help you more to produce more ketones and clean your body all the time, you know, um, yeah, it, it is part of the treatment. Yeah, it's part, uh, it's volunteer, is uh, um, in some people that are high risk, I would, I would not recommend to incorporate right away. I would recommend just to follow keto and then incorporate fasting because if you're low carb, uh, would be it would be more easier for you because your body, um, doesn't need a lot of carbs, are more keto adapted to just continue to do fasting, you know, will help you a lot. Yeah. Thank if you. you do fasting. Yeah. 
All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Teresa, there is one question somebody uh, was, is a dietitian asking on the procedures on how to join the, the groups. She or just to, contact me. Um, to, I, yeah, if she can, everyone can contact me even I can give you the guidelines from the low carb USA and a draft, a copy of the draft if this, if you need it, um, you know, and you can, you, everyone is welcome, it's free. It's free, they will not pay for that, but it's really like, you will learn a lot um, about how to manage your patients and we discuss cases, it's really, it's really amazing experience. Yeah, and we create guidelines too, um, like, I, like you saw that we did. Um, yeah, we, you can help us, yeah. Yeah, just put your email uh, on the chat box. Oh yeah, I it. will. Yeah, yeah, you can um do. Wait, no, I'm, I'm, I will. I will put your email. I mean, the first people who want to contact, just put your emails on the chat box, and I will. We will send you uh, uh, Teresa's email for contact. Yeah, uh, or you can. Um, I have yes, like. Yeah, it's already um, there. Yeah, it's already there. Uh, it's already there. Um, yeah, but it's for the host uh, and can, For easy uh, way to, you can um, scan. Like, let's see. Yeah, I, I think I got it. Uh, I'll put it up on the chat. Yeah, you can uh, scan this. Um, yeah. You can uh, scan it and then it will go to my website and then you can just send a message or uh, yeah. and let me know any anything that you guys need. Let me know if you want me to um, train dietitians to, about this. Yeah. I, um, yeah. You know, just let me know. I'm welcome to yeah. do it. Um, yeah. And yeah. Because this is interesting, and um, we can adapt this on what yeah. you guys eat, you know, in any country. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We can yeah. adopt this, yes. And and that's the thing. Maybe if they need guidelines on how to do it, I can help you guys. Yeah. Again, uh, 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 there are a few questions from, from nutrition people down. I see some few, three more questions. Yes. Three uh -huh. more. Mario, Elizabeth, yeah, yeah. and Bonnie. They are all nutrition people, but Elizabeth and Monica's are nutrition people. Thank you. Yes. There are two more questions. Is Elizabeth uh, this? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't, uh, Dr. Lloyd, I can't see these questions. Oh, it, it's at the bottom. You just scroll it up. Uh, Beteor, Mario, mm -hmm. in a, in a five-year research with 33% patients, success of reversal DM, what were the average years of most successful patients sustained to be able to stop medications? That's from that's the, that's the, the things that I, I asked um, there already because it's a was a preliminary data what they present oh, to okay. help. Um, they don't present the whole data. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if you are uh, interested on that and learn more, um, you can go to birtahealth.com and then. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, I can or just send me any kind of concern that you have, and then I will reach them. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a preliminary data. Um, yeah. the, the full data is not there. And then say for dialysis patient with diabetes, how do we make sure that they have enough calories to spare protein with concept of ketogenic diet and low carb? What I do with patient with diabetes, even I feel like, if patient with diabetes, they, um, you know, if they're in dialysis or um, or hemodialysis, especially, they can uh, follow low carb. And then what you do is you provide at least 0.8 um, to one grams per kilograms um, low carb, and then the rest is going to be good fats. Yeah, and then that will help maybe to decrease the uh, instead of maybe one times a week uh, or three times a week that they need dialysis, maybe that could decrease to. Um, two times a week because they will have less fluid retention, less sodium retention, less cardiovascular risk, you know, like all this risk that they will decrease if they follow this in a dialysis center. Yeah. Any okay. other? I don't see any other. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this very important. Can we clarify to one people? Okay, I said yeah, I just yeah. contact me yeah, yeah, and we, yeah, yeah. we welcome everyone that can help us. Will you yeah, can repeat yeah. the details of how we can join yeah. our group? Yes, yeah. just um, again, contact yeah. me yeah. and then I will, I will let you know yeah. how we can work together. So, so Teresa's email is in the chat box. Please take yeah. the email from chat, the chat box. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, couriersminrd.com or couriersminrd at gmail.com. Yeah. Or you can scan that and that will yeah, give I'm you. Can send. Yeah, we I take can you send to my website and then you can go to, um, you know, you can send me a message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, is there any other comment or questions? Uh, yeah, any other questions or comments? No. All right, so if there's no any other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Teresa for your time. That was excellent presentation and we really appreciate your time and the preparation that you put uh, in preparing this presentation. Dr. Lloyd, do you have any other any yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. This is really interesting. Again, uh, I think the next session will be on oxalates from your point. Oh, I um, love that. From yeah, genetics yeah. to all the yeah. way. More yeah, issue yeah. and yeah. all the way again talk yeah. about that, that will be very interesting, yeah. Because yeah. that's something that is, you know, it is like tucked away and nobody really knows of I mean, I, I I also, I mean, I think I'm quite ignorant about it and it's 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 a it's a very uh, interesting and important topic as well, especially uh, in the uh, in, in the younger age groups. And we have a lot of yes, we do have ESRD coming because of oxalosis, and yeah. quite often you won't diagnose it. And you don't mm -hmm. diagnose it unless you really uh, look for it. Otherwise, you miss it and just be on dialysis for years. And sometimes you transplant them, and you get caught with oxalosis yeah. just immediately transplant and you lose the graft at once. And that is yeah. uh, really shocking when you see them. Immediately, the, the, most the of them could be genetics. Like yes. I have that issue, and then yes. that, that's the reason I, I I know a lot of about oxalates because yes. I have that SNPs and and then I have high risk. But is it? It is even is simple things that we can manage. That it is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank, thank you for thank all you the dietitians that join us. Yeah, there are a lot of them. <laughs> I think a lot of them will come. I'm sure they will. Yes. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank everyone. you.